This one, this one's called I've Never Seen a War. This is an original song. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. And welcome to your neighborhood Unitarian Universalist congregation. 
My name is Suzanne, I'm the music director here, and I have your announcements for the coming week. Small groups are an excellent way to deepen our spiritual exploration and care for one another. Are there small groups on themes or topics that you would like to join or could offer to lead? Please share your ideas for small groups which could begin in the fall with Allison, our president. Uh, please check your recent email or our website calendar to see all the lists of events and details for time and place uh, that are happening this summer with our community. Things include in-person services, walk and rolls, labyrinth, talonite, picnic, meetups, drum circle, song circle, movie nights, and so much more. Share your ideas and help to shape next year's guest speaker lineup by becoming a member of the Sunday Service Coordination Team. We have a few members already, including Moira, Peter, myself, and we're looking for some more. <laughs> we'll start by envisioning our Sunday services for September and October. If you'd like to help out, you can talk to Peter. Thanks, Peter. Embodying the Eighth Principle, workshop number one, Awareness of Our Own Privilege and Bias, is happening Wednesday, June 22nd, 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, the working group is offering our first community workshop. We'll offer acti participatory activities that help us become more self-aware and provide a safe community space for sharing and learning from each other. Everyone is welcome and encouraged to attend. You can contact Bruce or myself if you'd like to learn more. Join the communications committee. Have you got writing skills? Are you social media savvy? Our VP is looking for a couple people to join the communications team to help craft our communication strategy and to get the word out about who we are. You can talk to Michelle if you're willing to help. Thanks, Michelle. The C Committee, Social and Environmental Action Committee, is hosting a Kairos blanket exercise here in the Rafos Sanctuary, which is where we are now, for the three congregations to learn more about the history of Indigenous people in Canada and as a step toward reconciliation. That's on Wednesday, September the 21st, in the evening from 6 to 9 p.m. You can contact Laura, who's at the back there, for more info. Saturday, June 25th, from noon to 5. Join us as we celebrate the life of Bruce Brackett. Bruce was a beloved husband, father, papa, brother, uncle, and friend. We invite you to join our family to toast this fabulous, amazing man. Beverages and a light lunch will be served. Cash bar. That's at the, Canad uh, the Royal Canadian Legion on Pape Avenue on the 25th of June, noon to five. Please RSVP if you're going to attend. Movie night. As mentioned at last week's service, here in the sanctuary, we will be screening The Singing Revolution, which is a film on how choral singing helped to restore independence to the Baltic nations from the Soviet Union. That's gonna be next Sunday evening at 7.30 p.m. All are welcome, it's a free event, and you can bring your own snacks and wear your PJs if you want and have a movie night here in the sanctuary. Uh, you can talk to me if you'd like to learn more. This week's question to the community. Tell us of a time that a moment of compassion led you to make a commitment. Ponder this. There will be time in the service to share your reflections as well as in breakout rooms after service is over. Next Sunday, our theme will be Inuit spirituality. Service weaver will be Alison Kabayama. Message of inspiration provided by Nalak Ledru and music by our own Kim Knudsen. We welcome you to our Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Congregation service. Thank you for joining us, both here in our sanctuary and at home on Zoom. My name is Gordon Thorne, and I will be your service weaver this morning. This service is being recorded both for the public on YouTube and on our website. Uh, joys and concerns will be edited out, 
If you are here in our sanctuary and have privacy concerns, you can set, sit at the back, centered under the camera. Um, and uh, if you are on Zoom, you can turn off your camera uh, so you're not seen and rename yourself. Now, I say that, but we hope you won't. Part of being in spiritual community is being seen, risking a lack of anonymity to participate with others in building an authentic spiritual community. We hope that is what you'll do. Now, we have nowhere else to go, no, nothing else to do. So now, let us bring our hearts, minds, and spirits together as one as we give greeting and gratitude for being with each other. This is our threshold moment. Let us enter sacred space together. Our service begins now. This morning, the chalice will be lit by Susan Cross via, via Zoom. I think Susan, Susan is there. Um, we're going to just bring up her camera. Can you do that, Reese? There's Susan. Good. Susan, uh, can we ask you to light your chalice while we light ours? And Suzanne sings. Go ahead, Suzanne. done. Thank you, Susan. Our prelude today will be by our own spirit band. So, spirit band, take it away. Hello. This song is called Do Something. And basically, it's about if you see something and you think something should be done, maybe you should do it. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> to do something. I'm so tired of talking about how we all get our hands and feet and it's easier to say than to be live like angels in apathy who tell ourselves it's all right somebody else will do something But I'm sick and tired of life with no desire. I want a flame, I want a fire. I want to be the one who stands up and says, I'm going to do something. If not us, then who?
time for us to do something. Yes, it is. If not now, then when will we see an end? Tall is pain. Oh, oh, it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. We are the salt of the earth. We are the city on the hill. Shine, 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 shine. We're never going to change the world by standing still. No, we won't stand still. No, we won't stand still. No, if not us, then who? If not me, then you. Right now, oh, oh, it's time for us to do something. If not now, then when will we see an end? Tall is pain. Oh, oh, it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. Oh, it's time for us to do something. Don't do nothing. It's time for us to do something. Welcome again. I start by acknowledging that the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations who lived here before me and are living here now, together with the Métis and Inuit, I offer my gratitude to our First Nations for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. And I will work to honor these teachings. Good morning and welcome. This morning I have the double delight to welcome Mary-Pierre Montagnier uh, on video from Thailand who will be our speaker and of course our very own spirit band. Our minister at least until the end of the month and the minister emeritus is the Reverend Wayne Walder. Our musical director is Suzanne Zars. Z. Getchell facilitates the uh, child caregiver and child and caregiver program. We also have Mike Kozowski doing the Zoom web hosting duties and the multi-talented Reese Rogers who is handling the soundboard and the camera today. Thank you to all of them. By, no, by now you all know a bit of Zoom etiquette. If you uh, have a Zoom, uh, a Zoom tech question or concern, send a direct chat message to Mike. Uh, for those in the sanctuary, we have a wiggle room off to the side of the sanctuary. This is a room that small active children and their parents can go to where they can hear and see the service but not be heard. Um, you are welcome to try it out. Uh, it's an option, not a requirement. We also, uh, if you have hearing challenges, as I do, uh, we have assisted hearing devices you can borrow at the sound desk. Just go see Reist. Um, you are welcome to try them out. I have, and they work great. Uh, we are open to many beliefs and learn from many traditions. We welcome all people to our religious community. Our services can vary from week to week, so we encourage you to sample several to get a better feeling for who we are and what we do here. If you are visiting us today for the first time, we welcome you and encourage you to stay after service and enjoy coffee and conversation time in the cappuccino room, which is the room just behind us. Now, that's not uh, named after a drink, but after Bonnie and Fred Cappuccino, who were prominent Unitarians and have a charity called Child Haven that has homes all over India and Nepal. 
More on that in a moment. I ask all of you in neighborhood to seek out anyone who is new and engage them in conversation. Welcome them and tell them about who we are. Our mission at Neighborhood is to empower spiritual growth and shared action for the care of our world. Shared action for the care of our world is a wide topic, a wide target. Remember hearing from Natalie and Bruce and Nancy about keeping active hope alive in a life of activism? Only last week, we heard from the common thread in the streets about the power of music and protest. This week, we're going to broaden it out a bit, way out. What is it like to have a career in humanitarian relief in some of the toughest conflicts in the world? What's it like to be in the middle of a humanitarian crisis? How can you maintain your commitment and humanity in the face of tragic events? This is what we will hear from Mary Pierre. I met Mary Pierre through my partner, Michelle. In 2011, she went to volunteer at a child haven home in Kalyampundi, India, run by Bonnie and Fred Cappuccino. Mary Pierre was there as well, and the, the two bo the volunteers bonded. For Michelle, uh, it meant the creation of the child haven fundraising dinners that found a home in our old Hiawatha sanctuary. For Mary Pierre, it was a taste of service and commitment that would lead her into a career as a humanitarian emergency specialist for, uni uni for organizations like Doctors Without Borders and the United Nations. Now, think about our mission statement. Because as we struggle to, to define ourselves once our founding minister leaves, we'll be looking to our mission statement for clarity to empower spiritual growth and shared action for the care of our world. Growing spiritually helps us build compassion and resist resilience in the face of a changing and challenging world. Shared action shares that compassion and resilience with the community and the bigger world. By helping to care for the world, that spirit of service and commitment in turn, feeds our own spirit. Mary Pierre made a choice to use her gifts to care for the world. What will you do with your gifts? In the words of Rebecca Ann Parker, your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reach of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry, to bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, ab abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. We must answer this question, what are you going to do with your gifts? <laughs> now is the time to greet your neighbors. Uh, now, adopt an attitude of consent and respect physical distances. After you've greeted a few neighbors, turn to the camera at the back wall and offer a greeting to those who are joining us virtually. For those on Zoom, please briefly unmute your device, switch to gallery view, and offer a greeting to those around you, and then to the people in the sanctuary. Suzanne will sign, sound a chime to end. Now, take a moment to greet the neighbors around you. Susan, hi, Julie. Hi, Judy. Good to see you again, Judy. Hi, Dee Dee. Hi, hey, 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 Bill and Brenda. Hi there, Ernie. Is that good? Hi, Mike. Just a few more zooms before the summer holidays. Morning, Bill. Good morning, Brenda. Good morning. 
morning. Enjoy your you coffee. To find your seat again. <laughs> now, join me in reading our opening words, which will appear on your screen. Let us cast the circle of a sacred space here. Let us cast the circle of a cherished space here, a space of safety, a place of forgiveness, a place of love. If we want the world to change, we must craft in our space and in ourselves the seeds that grow a different kind of life, a life of graciousness, of creative intelligence, a place of life and spirit for ourselves and our families. Okay, so now is the time for the question to the community. Um, and the question is, tell us a time that a moment of compassion led you to make a commitment. I'm going to do a bit of a wane here. So uh, let it, let's hear from two or three members of the community here in the sanctuary. Raise your hands and I will bring the microphone to you so that everyone in the room and online can hear you. Um, again, the question is, Tell us about a time that a moment of compassion led you to a commitment. Peter first. I was teaching in high school in the year 2000 when one of our students, a young man called Dibs, committed suicide because he was gay, he was Sikh, and he felt he couldn't live with both who he was and within his community and that there was no way forward. He was a lovely young man and we were, I was so heartbroken by Dib's death that I founded a group called AHA, the Anti-Homophobic Alliance. And we put on plays, we had meetings, we formed the Triangle Bulletin Board as a safe space where gays and lesbians and other non-traditional students across Peel could meet and work with each other, and it really did make some permanent changes in Dib's memory coming out of that tragedy. Thank you. Christina, did you have? I do. Um, in 2014, um, I became, uh, sorry, in 2016, I became a PSW. Um, when I was a child, I was cared for so many people. And I've, when I became an adult, I, I wanted to find a way to give back the care that I received when I was a child. So, um, so I became a PSW, and um, I feel that I'm, I'm fulfilling that now. Thank you. Kurt? Um, a teacher of mine at one point basically taught me how to speak in a positive way about myself. So I've made the compassionate commitment to speak about people using person first and other affirming ways of language. Thanks, Kurt. Anybody else? Oh, sure. Yes, well, my uncle struggles with addictions, mental health issues. Um, I guess in all these years, I always wish the best for him, and I just try to do my best to live life, but try to be aware of addictions within myself, be there for others, and he's still alive, and he's in BC in his happy place. I'm good. He's good. Thank you. Thank you all for helping out with that. That was my uh, first time doing question to the community, so <laughs> appreciate that. Well, uh, Suzanne, 
Would you like to introduce our first song? Yes, I would like to introduce it. Um, let's rise in spirit and sing with me, please. Our world is one world, a song of the interconnected web of which we are all a part. Good morning, everybody. I am going to invite all of the young and young apart to come up nice and close because it's time for our Time for All Ages. And I want to start our Time for All Ages this week by thanking our guest speaker, Marie-Pierre Montigny, for sending us the wonderful talk that the, the grown-ups are going to hear in a few minutes. Grown-ups. <laughs> yeah. In that talk, she tells us about her work as a humanitarian helping people in crisis situations all around the world. And she shares a few lessons with us that she's learned from that work. For our time for all ages today, I'm going to be talking a bit more about one of these lessons. The lesson that I chose is to change your perspective, which is a pretty fancy way to say, try looking at things in a different way. Or as we've spoken of before here, try looking at things through a different lens. Because if you're able to, weigh, to change the way you look at things, you might be able to change the way you think or even feel about them. For example, if I was trying to do something like, say, build a wall, and it wasn't quite working out the way I wanted, it would be very easy for me to feel frustrated that I wasn't doing as well at building this wall that I thought I could. And I can say with experience that frustration is only going to make it get worse. But if I'm able to look at the wall as a challenge, which for me, a challenge is something that I like. I'm excited at the thought of tackling a challenge. So if I can see the wall as a challenge, then I get excited to figure it out, and feeling better about it will make sure I get that wall built. Now you might be thinking, how can we change our perspective? How can we see things something differently than the way we already see it? The answer is practice, my friends. Practice is how to change your perspective. There's a story that I read for you all a while ago, and I think it shows how if you can practice at it, not only can you change your own perspective, but you can change that of those around you as well. That story is Gregory the Terrible Eater. It's a story about a pretty average young goat named Gregory who did not want to eat the same things as other goats. Gregory wanted nothing to do with clothes, shoes, and bottle caps, no matter how his parents tried to convince him that it was good for him. Instead, Gregory told his parents he wanted to eat fruits and vegetables, he dreamed of eating fish, bread, and butter. Gregory's parents didn't know what to do. They wanted him to eat enough to become a strong, healthy goat. Eventually, they took him to the doctor, Dr. Ram. <laughs> well, Gregory and Dr. Ram talked about it, 
And when Gregory was asked why he didn't want to eat any of the goat food his parents offered him, he simply said, I want to eat what I like. Well, Dr. Ram knew just what to do. He told Gregory's parents that Gregory needed to get the taste for new food slowly and suggested trying one new thing every day until Gregory would eat everything. And that's just what they did. They started introducing new foods into, Gregory, new, into the food that Gregory already liked. They gave him things like spaghetti with shoelaces, green beans with rubber, soup and its whole can, and ice cream in its whole box. It wasn't long until Gregory was eating everything, including the family's things that weren't supposed to be food. In fact, Gregory began to eat so much that one day he ended up trying to eat way too much and spent the whole night with an awful tummy ache. The next morning, Gregory's whole family seemed to have changed the way they look at food. And they ate, all together, a balanced meal of scrambled eggs, waxed paper, and a glass of orange juice. So that was our time for all ages for today. And that was how Gregory and his parents changed their views on food. Should we say we go have our program now? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Let's go out this way. This is a unique time in our service when we invite you to share a joy or concern in your life. Well, if not, I like this final candle for all the joys and concerns left unspoken in our hearts. I'd now like to uh, introduce Mary-Pierre Montagné, our speaker today, but I feel like I already have. Uh, I follow the, tra the travels of Mary-Pierre on Facebook and share her pain when, as a, an emergency coordinator with MSF or the UN, she handles uh, crisis responses in places like the Congo, Lebanon, and Yemen. I have also enjoyed following her vacation pictures uh, from around the world as she takes much needed recovery time. Uh, Michelle and I have met her at the Dupi Palace around the corner from our old uh, Hiawatha home almost 10 years ago when she was considering this life uh, she has chosen. Since then, she has never stopped traveling. I also want to mention that she has donate, donated her speaker's honorarium to Child Haven. So, welcome, Mary Pierre. Hi everyone, I'm very pleased to be joining you today, although unfortunately I cannot be live uh, because I'm on the other side of the planet. As you can see behind me, I'm in beautiful Thailand, uh, but I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be here. Um, I would just like to start by thanking uh, all the team, uh, Anna, Gordon, and also my dear friend Michelle. Um, thanks to all of you for yeah, inviting me as a guest speaker, but also for, for trusting that I would uh, have a message of inspiration to bring uh, today. Um, without further ado, uh, today I would just like to start by introducing myself and my field of work, sharing an experience that I've been through uh, through this work and also some lessons learned from it. Um, so my name is Mary Pierre, I'm an emergency specialist, um, well that's the title of my position, I'm a humanitarian aid worker, I've been working in emergencies, in humanitarian emergencies for the past 10 years, um, I've worked for the United Nations, for Doctors Without Borders, Care Canada and a few other organizations, um, I'm currently supporting the emergency response in Myanmar, um, last year I was also in Yemen which was uh, categorized as the worst humanitarian emergency in the world at that time. 
Um, I also went to Lebanon after the Beirut port explosion. I worked in Somalia, which is a highly insecure environment for aid workers. I've worked a lot in Central Africa as well, in Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, in Malawi, Senegal. I've worked in Haiti as well. And uh, yes, I started this whole journey uh, in one of the wonderful home of Child Even uh, International in India. Um, so yes, through this work, what we do is then when there's an either a man-made uh, catastrophe or a natural disaster, uh, we assess the needs of the population and uh, do our best to respond to the priority needs. So this is basically our our work. So um, I'd like to share an experience. Um, it happened a few years ago. I was emergency uh, coordinator and we were implementing an emergency response uh, in, in Central Africa and it was about 30 to 40 kilometers from the main front line of the conflict in the country. Um, this front line was uh, two rebel armed groups who were fighting against each other for the control of the area, which was of course affecting all of the population surrounding. Uh, we've decided to set up a hospital to be able to treat uh, to provide medical treatment to the communities, specifically to children and women, uh, because these people didn't have access to basic services for a long time. So during the day, we would be treating the community, and then at night, sometimes we would be receiving wounded soldiers who would also be coming to our hospital for treatment. I know from an outsider perspective, it can seem surprising to know that in one room, we treat the victims of the conflict, and then in the other room, we treat sort of the perpetrator of the conflict. Although, as humanitarian workers, we are bounded by some principles, uh, which are humanity, independence, impartiality, uh, and equality, which, without going into details, basically means that we provide assistance to people based on their needs and only their needs. Doesn't matter who is a person, where she comes from, uh, anything else, only their needs. Um, everybody has the right to access basic services and everybody has the right to dignity. So as I was the emergency coordinator, I would be spending some time in the hospital. Uh, just to put things into perspective, when I say hospital, I mean it was basically a few rooms, there was no electricity, there was no water, um, and it was you know, not necessarily the cleanest area uh, as well as it was a very dry area. Um, I would be spending some time with uh, the soldiers and visiting them as well. Um, I've actually got to, to know them a little bit. Um, they, they, I, I'd like to mention that they've always been very polite to me. They would usually get up uh, when I was coming in their room, uh, even if they were wounded. Some of them had bullet shots in a few places in their body. Uh, they would also be calling me Madame Muju, uh, which is a sign of respect to, to use the name uh, Madame. Muju means uh, outsider, white person. Um, and then they would, they would always be asking me so many questions like, how is life in Canada? How is your family? But more specifically, what are kids our age doing there? What is their life like? Um, because it's important to mention that um, I would say 80% of the soldiers there uh, were less than 18 years old. So basically they were kids. Um, and the rest of them went, would be like 20, the beginning of their, their 20s. Uh, most of them have been uh, kidnapped or abducted from their village when they were young and they were raised by the commander of the army who, whom they would consider as their family. So um, yeah, and then with time, with getting to know them, they would be also sharing me some of their hopes and dreams. They would tell me that they just wish that the war was over. They wish that they could go to another country when there, where there is no war. They wish they would be uh, in their village. They wish, um, the wish that would come back all the time was that they wish that they would go to school. Um, 
So one of the lessons from this experience is definitely that to change our perspective. From one hand, we can look at these soldiers as killers, murderers, uh, bad people. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what I was seeing were children who didn't have the same choices as other children around the world, uh, who were not provided with these the same opportunities. Um, but you can tell by, by in their heart that they were not bad people actually, and they didn't even actually want this violence. Um, so it's very, our perspective on, on things and people is definitely one of the biggest lessons here. Another, another factor to take into consideration is that these factions who were fighting for the control of the zone, it was a very rich soil with a lot of uh, precious stone. Um, so it's also a good opportunity uh, from, my, from, from, from my perspective to look at what our action, how our action can impact other people on the other side of the world uh, without even knowing, for example, the fact that Western culture uh, gives a lot of importance to jewelry, to diamond, to gold. Um, <clears throat> people in mine, in the mines area, uh, they definitely suffer a lot and uh, it creates a lot of conflict that uh, innocent victims uh, quite suffer quite a lot of. So it's a good, uh, it was a good lesson for me to understand that not only my action can influence my own little world, but also can influence um, the life of other people uh, very far away from me, but that I did have the power to make changes that would contribute to the well-being of, uh, of the community. For example, if I decide that I do not want to buy certain certain things uh, because it creates problem in some other places, uh, then it's in my power to do so. Um, so I really strongly, strongly believe that our indiv individual actions can really influence um, the world and to actually even create a, a better world. It won't be a cause to effect, an immediate cause to effect, although with time, uh, it can definitely make changes. <clears throat> Besides that, I think that um, ref uh, as a reflection of being uh, an aid worker and also being of service to others, I think to be in touch with some of the worst suffering in the world, it uh, definitely changes you. Uh, even though it is difficult, I think <laughs> when you see how much people are suffering, it gives you an immense and infinite gratitude for every little things that you have in your life. And when you end up focusing on these positive aspects in your life, you do like it, they, <laughs> even more positive things comes to you, in my opinion. Um, and also uh, on in addition to gratitude, it's also about compassion. I think when you see suffering, when you develop your compassion towards others, it can really change your attitude, your relationship, and also, again, it can also have an impact on the world around you. So those are two very, very powerful lessons to, to make sure that you always focus on gratitude and compassion. Um, <laughs> we are already past 10 minutes um, and so I think I would like, I, I will have to stop here. Uh, I would have loved to go a bit more into details, uh, but hopefully um, this experiences and, and lessons learned have planted a seed uh, in your day today and uh, be very happy to hear any questions, any feedback, or um, if you'd like to, to reach out, I'd be more than happy. So thanks again for having me and have a wonderful day. <laughs> I wonder if uh, Mary Pierre is gonna see the video of the service. And if she does, thank you, Mary Pierre. Now is the time for meditation or prayer. I'd like to do a loving kindness or metta uh, guided meditation. It's a meditation that's rooted in the Buddhist tradition. 
and Suzanne is going to help me. So choose a comfortable position with your feet on the ground and your hands comfortably in your lap. Some people close their eyes, some people don't. There's no wrong ways. Now, just take a moment to concentrate on how your body feels. Feel each arm, each leg, your torso, your face, letting go of any tension. Listen to the blood flowing. I know I can at times. A little twitches sometimes. The minute vibrations that your body produces. Now I want you to re repeat the following words silently as Suzanne sings. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. And again, may I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be whole. Pause for a while, contemplate what the words truly mean, and try to gauge how they are making you feel inside. Now think of someone you love, someone that inspires feelings of warmth and kindness, and keeping them in mind, repeat the words as Suzanne sings. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be whole. Now think of someone you saw on the street yesterday or interacted with in a store or a business, a stranger, and repeat the following words as Suzanne sings. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease, may you be whole.
Now visualize yourself being loving and empathetic towards others, towards people in countries in conflict, to people perhaps Mary Pierre might have helped. And say, may we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be, be, may we be peaceful and at ease. May we be whole. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be filled with loving kindness. May be safe. May you all have the strength to overcome your struggles. May you always be surrounded with people who love you and care for you. So, now is the time for our offertory. Sharing of ourselves is part of every faith. Volunteer efforts are essential, but salaries are paid and programs created by your contributions. These are essential to our continued existence. It too, takes two people alone to handle the online portion of every service. Members of neighborhood choose a variety of different ways to give e either through offerings in the basket um, or predated checks, e-transfers, and automatic withdrawals. I remember Bob Raffos, who we found out later was one of our most generous con uh, contributors, uh, also made it a, happen a habit to contribute every week to the basket. When the basket finds uh, its way to you, like our guest speaker, I ask you to be generous. Uh, if you're online, please use the link displayed on the screen when which leads you to our donation page on our website. And greeters, uh, please bring the baskets to the front when you're finished, uh, and we'll now pause and uh, let Suzanne sing. Thank you. 
Acceptance here, if you have found home here, if you have known kindred spirits here, let this offering be a token of gratitude for our common life as we build the common good. One more song. Thanks, yes, let's end with support for each other. If we could rise in spirit to sing Bill Withers, Lean On Me. Yeah, and just to let people, Bill Withers passed away this last uh, year, so this is kind of uh, in, in, in uh, remembrance of him. Right on. So I'm going to invite Susan to extinguish her chalice on Zoom while we extinguish ours in the sanctuary. Can we get to Susan up on the screen? There she is. Although our chalice has been dark. Thank you, Susan. For those of you who do not wish to join a breakout room on Zoom, thank you for joining us. 
Everyone who remains here will be asked to join a breakout room on Zoom. Uh, today's question to consider is the same one as the question to the community. Tell us about a time that a moment of compassion led you to make a commitment. Well, today I'm going to leave you with the words of um, Edward Hale. I am only one, but I am still one. I cannot do everything, but I can do, still do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something I can do. So, together, let us say namaste, which means I salute the power and the spirit within you. Neighborhood, namaste. Namaste. Thank you, everybody, on Zoom. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. The service is over. Go in peace. Namaste. Namaste.